Celeste Marie Bernier and I am personal chair in Black Studies and of English Literature at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm also co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of American Studies published by Cambridge University Press and currently I'm in the US on the senior John Hope Franklin Fellowship at the National Humanities Centre. I've had a 20-year career so far, and I work across slavery studies, African diasporic studies, African Caribbean studies, and African American studies. Across my work, I ask and think around one question. How do we begin to imagine, how do we begin to recreate the imaginative inner lives of women, children, and men transported against their will as a result of the African diaspora and the transatlantic slave trade from the 16th century, and which we very much live with the legacies today? pleasure to be in the Renalda House Museum and to be standing in front of the Whippin by Horace Pippin. Now Horace Pippin was a World War I combat soldier. He fought in an African-American segregated company and he was one among the very few who were trained to bear arms. As we know, the life of the black soldier was the life of the unknown soldier. We have very uh, many difficulties in recovering the archives, recovering the artworks, recovering the history of those who lived and those who died in the frontline trenches. Here we have an exception. Horace Pippin fought but did not die in the trenches and he came back to tell his story. Now for Horace Pippin, as a man growing up in the United States, one born of enslaved and free descendants in the modern world, he was an individual who was committed to freedom at any cost. When we stand and we look at the whipping, which is perhaps his most hard-hitting and controversial painting, and he created a body of a hundred works, we are reminded of that freedom struggle. When we look at this painting, we understand that no man's land takes many forms. So as any veteran will tell you, there's a no man's land of the Argonne, a green and a dark so black you cannot see the hand in front of your face, which Pippin immortalizes in the blades of green-black grass that you see here. We also understand in the US as a founding nation of freedom and liberty and the lives that all individuals will have the freedom to protect, we see here too the US flag, the blue, white and red, translating into a horror of atrocity and struggle. Here we have Pippin memorializing the no man's land of slavery. And he was an artist who was committed to memorializing the struggle, the life and death struggle, as he fought for freedom on the frontline trenches in 1917, at the same time that he sought to memorialize the lives of his ancestors. In collecting this work, this major work by Horace Pippin, we have the chance and the opportunity to see how he told that story. What you're looking at is not a canvas. You're looking at wood grain, where he used disused wood from furniture that he burnt his story into using a hot poker. I spoke of no man's land and I spoke of struggle. The reason is that we see this in the fact that his right arm was shot by a German sniper. So for a great deal of his life, Pippin was unable to move his right arm. He came back to art, and as he would say, he came back to life through painting. And he took a, po a poker from the fire, he took it out of the fire, he warmed it up, and he incised these burn markings to create figures on wood. Not just any figures. What you're looking at is an individual who's been stripped prior to a whipping. Horace Pippin was committed to the freedom struggle. He was committed to the idea that trauma cannot be represented. For those who lived and died in slavery, for those who lived and died in war, the struggles and the suffering on flesh the burned red markings you see in the last striking here are nothing compared to the wounds upon our soul. This was one of the testimonies of the veterans. And what you see Pippin immortalizing here for us is the US South, and we stand here in Minolda House in North Carolina, a state which was very much embroiled in the trade, and we think to those legacies. We think of Harriet Jacobs, who lived here. And so Horace Pippin is very much keen to tell the stories not of Harriet Jacobs, not of Harriet Tubman, but of the unknown lives of those whose skin was scarified in the story of the slave trade. As you look at Pippin's work, you understand its power. And this is one of the most powerful works that he created, precisely because you see 
every blade of grass. His technique in this period was to incise through paint every incision, every textured layer. You also see the skin tone of the whites who are brutally beating the figure who we are unable to tell is male or female. This is deliberate by Pippin because he speaks to the struggle of those who lived and died in slavery, women, children and men. You also see the cabins in the background and you see the overseer waiting far in the distance. One thing you also notice about Horace Pippin is that in terms of skin colour, his white folk are ghostly. This is for Pippin's memorialization of white people as cadavers. They kill, they maim, they destroy black bodies in this period. One of the most powerful memories that lived on for Horace Pippin was the ghost-like memory of lynching. And we see him immortalizing not only slavery, not only the struggle of the Argonne and the blood-red poppy killing fields that you see at the bottom here, but you also see the ongoing struggle against lynching. For Pippin, throughout his life, and as you see here, is his motto, I cannot forget suffering and I will never forget sunset.